Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Harsh was asking me about the exams, the test for certification. Um, let me do it. Again. I, it probably wasn't as clear as it could be on the written thing, so let me do it now. There's three tests, basically. <clears throat> Two on the last weekend and one probably a month or so after you finish your classwork. All right. So the two on the last week, last weekend will be a, a competency exam, practical competency. Now, what it will do is I'll give you a check off sheet. As I see you consistently doing a technique reasonably well, well enough to pass, I'll give you two marks. One is for setup and the other one is for thrust. Um, and that'll happen all over the weekend, and possibly at the beginning of the second weekend third weekend. Um, and as I was saying, I couldn't uh, too harsh. Most of the time, you won't even be, you know, you know you're being tested. It will be a practice weekend. We'll also be doing some new techniques as well that weekend. Not many, hopefully, but it'll be a practice technique and there'll be rapid rounds of practice. And then as I see you doing well, I'll give you a mark for that particular technique. All right. I think there's about 20 techniques that you've got to do and you have to get them all done. All right, it's only ever been a problem once. Um, and one student was missing two techniques, and uh, she was in Calgary, so I went and did it with her. It cost me a speeding ticket doing it, um, but we did it at a clinic. And there was one in Edmonton, I got um, Bob Sidman to do that for me. The other one on the last weekend is you're going to do a labeled diagram of the um, vertebra basilar system. Okay. It takes about 15 minutes, not much more than that. And you'll get so much practice of doing this. I'll go over this every weekend with you. Every single weekend we'll do this at least once or twice. And it won't be a problem, which is exactly what I want it. I want this rope. I don't want it. You're worried about figuring things out with it. I want it pretty much wrote, a bit like a times table, so you won't forget it in a hurry. You'll have to actively try to forget it by the time you know. So that's not going to be a problem for you. And then the last test will be an online multiple choice matching select and that sort of thing, that sort of question. Um, and we'll do that maybe a month after you finish your classwork to give you a chance to, um, hey Bella, Good morning. a chance to put stuff together review what you've learned um, and that. So um, generally speaking, let's see, out of 20 people, one or two may fail it. Um, not a big deal. You get to take it again anytime you want to. I'd suggest fairly soon rather than later. Um, I've only ever had one person not do, not get certification with this and they failed the written exam and then didn't want to take it again. I don't, it baffles me, um, but that was it. So it's not a huge um, barrier, but you do have to understand it and know it, okay? But there's no tricky questions on it, um, on the written. There's nothing on the competency test that's gonna be weird for you. You've done all, all of these techniques. And the drawing, as I say, will be just burned into your brain. Okay. Is there anything else you want to ask me about that? No, you're good with it? Okay. Anything else you want to ask me? About previous these things, these Zooms. Jim, mm -hmm. where is this location just for like booking hotels and stuff? The one in Calgary? Yeah. That is um, Panther Sports Physical Therapy. It's in the Northwest. It's, um, there's a rec center there. I've only just got it confirmed. So I'm gonna show it. <laughs> they have <to> spell paper. <laughs> K 
country else there is. I have a stupid woman. So it's v, the it's a rec center. It's Vivo for healthier generations, and it's eleven nine fifty Country Village Link, Northeast Calgary. Perfect. Seven. Thank you. I'll send it out with the um, Zoom recording. Okay. Anything else? Okay. All right. So let's have a look. That's no good. I need to share the screen, don't I? All right, so let's talk about neurological symptoms first, and we'll go from there. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to be talking about all of these, um, and we'll just define them quickly. And if there's any others you want to talk about, then let me know. And if I don't know them, I'll look them up for you. If um, if any of these, if I'm not, if you don't know these ones, any of these, just say so, okay? And we'll get a little bit more detail on them. So the first five there: paresthesia, dyskusia, parosmia, tinnitus, and scintillations are all denervation sensations. So when you go deaf, you replace hearing with tinnitus. When you lose the sense of touch, you replace it with paresthesia. Taste is dyskusia, paraosmia is loss of smell, and scintillations are flashing spots in your eyes. Do any of you get um, migraine? Nobody? I do. Okay, do you get visual stuff with it? I don't like bright lights. Okay, but it's just that you don't like it. But you yeah. don't actually get um, these flashing lights in your vision. No, usually. No. Okay. What, what auras do you get? Or do you? I wouldn't say I really do. I usually just go lay in bed and try to put pressure on my head and forget about it. Okay, so you're getting migraine without aura. Mm -hmm. Okay, so scintillations are flashing spots in your visual field. Now, um, where you're getting those flashing spots, you're blind. Now, this is often hemianopia or quadranopia. Sometimes it's central, um, but the, underneath that flashing spots is a blind area. Um, and that's the most common um, pre or post dromic symptom um, that you get with migraine. I actually get the opposite view. What I get is I get the aura, the flashing lights, um, and nausea without the headache. Um, and that still could be me having sort of transient ischemic attacks, but I prefer migraine as a diagnosis. So it works better for me. Um, anyway, these all replace the symptom. So uh, paresthesia is tingling. Um, now it's a little different from other types of tingling. This is, um, you can get a reactive tingling. We'll talk about that in a second, but this true paresthesia is a replacement symptom. Um, and underneath the paresthesia, if you test it, particularly when they are parasitic, you will see loss of sensation. Dyskusia can be anything. In fact, you've probably all had this. If, you, if you've been to the dentist and had an anesthetic there, you get that bit of metallic taste in your mouth. You know that one? That is dyskusia. It's an, it's an invented sensation to replace the loss of sensation. Paraosmia is smell. This is typical with um, 
as an omen of a stroke coming on, actually. So paraosmia can be feces, cedar chippings, smoke, burnt, anything. Um, so it just, again, it's a, it's a smell that isn't there. You know, it's funny because I had this once, or I thought I did. I was sitting, this is when we first came to Mexico, I was sitting on the set, watching TV, and I was typing up a PowerPoint presentation at the same time. And it was on this. And as I'm typing, I'm going, what the hell is that? And it was crap. It felt, it smelled like feces. So bloody cat, a cat. So I'm walking around the house and the smell's going with me. So I thought, oh God, it's not the cat. I'm in the middle of a stroke here. I walk back to where I started from and the cat had crapped on the couch and I had it on my pants and my shirt. <laughs> well, I didn't know whether to kick the cat or cuddle the cat. Yeah. Um, but that's exactly what that is. Both of these can be cerebral or they can be from the brain stem. Tinnitus is, 80% of tinnitus is hearing loss. The other 20% um, is variable and it can be a tumor, that sort of thing. Um, and there's two types of tinnitus, high frequency and low frequency, like bells, whistles, um, musical sounds even. And then there's the low frequency, which is water noises, roaring, um, whooshing sounds. And the difference between the two is that high frequency tinnitus is usually caused by neurological problems and low frequency by conduction problems. That is sound getting into your ear. Um, so it's a significant difference between the two. You know, one is one may be very urgent, the other one isn't. Um, and as I say, scintillations is visual. Now they, they're all replacement sensations. The rest of these are not. So dysesthesia um, is when your body feels a sensation that is not appropriate to the stimulus. So if I take a pinwheel, for example, and I'm testing sensation, and you tell me it's tingly, um, then that's dysesthesia. Um, so you're getting a the wrong sensation to it. Now, most dysesthesias are perceived as a patient as painful. So they're often clumped into the next one, which is allodynia. Now I'm going to bring these all together, but these two together, we could say they're pretty much the same causes. Allodynia is where every stimulus feels like pain. Now the cause of these two things can be neurological. Um, diabetes can cause both of these. Um, some central nervous system conditions can cause this as well. Um, but both of them can be caused simply because of the intensity of the pain that's bringing the patient in to see you. So this is particular, it has to be fairly intensive pain though. Um, acute flare-ups of rheumatoid, anything you apply to that area, say the knee's all blown up and you just touch it with light touch, they'll scream that as painful. So it's a conversion of a one um, stimulus into an opposite or to the wrong perception. Either it's painful or it's incorrect, okay? Now, as I say, these can be neurophysiological and they can be neurological. You don't see these too often, so I wouldn't mess with them too much if you don't know what you're doing with them. I would assume that these are neurological and fire them out. Um, so diabetes does it. Any form of neuropathy uh, can do it as well. Hyperesthesia is when the stimulus has felt as higher than it is. They feel it as the appropriate stimulus, but it's considered to be more than it should be. Um, and this is often neurophysiological. Uh, segmental facilitation, for example, will do this, but it can also be uh, neurological. Um, so again, diabetes can do it, neuropathies can do it and so on. Tends not to be as potentially serious as the other two, um, but nonetheless, it needs to be considered carefully. Dizziness isn't necessarily neurological at all. Um, it's not even necessarily neurophysiological. Well, I suppose it is neurophysiological. Um, neurological dizziness, we've, I think we talked about dizziness before, haven't we? Have we? If we haven't, I'll do it again. But um, neurological dizziness, well, let's do it differently. Dizziness comes in three types, initially anyway. So your initial 
categorization of dizziness must be from the patient's symptoms. Now, if you look in most textbooks, they'll straight away categorize it as um, central, neurological, and peripheral, non-neurological. And this is the way it's normally um, given, which is fine if you, you're learning this from a book. If you're understanding it from a patient, it doesn't work terribly well. You need to make the classification, not the book. So better than that is a symptomatic-based um, categorization rather than etiology one. Then you can go to the etiology afterwards. So this comes in three flavors, type one, type two, type three. Type one is an illusion of movement. So this is going to be vertigo, um, oscillopsia. They're the two main ones. Now, oscillopsia is generally a swaying movement. You feel like this is what's happening to you or the environment, but it can be up and down. It can be backwards and forwards. So it oscillates. It doesn't, doesn't sway, but it oscillates. In fact, there's a condition called bobbin oscillopsia. I love this one. So if you drink enough booze, you will likely have vertigo. And I'm pretty sure you've all felt this. You have too much to drink. You lay on the bed, the room's spinning around, and you figure the best thing you can do is grab the bed and turn the lights on. And the vertigo usually stops. And what you're doing is you're equalizing the input. Um, if you drink a bit more, and this is for semi-professionals now, if you drink a bit more, you get bobbin oscillopsia. And what that is, when you walk, every time your foot hits the ground, the environment goes up and down. <laughs> and it's really weird when it happens. It's just on, boom, boom. Every step you take, it's just everything um, goes up and down. That happened to me a couple of times, and it's an interesting sensation. Um, so neurological vertigo, which is the one you normally come across rather than oscillopsia, neurological vertigo is um, tends to be long duration and mild to moderate. Peripheral vertigo tends to be short duration and severe. If you don't sit down, you're going to fall down, that type of severity. Um, there's some other differences as well. Um, neurological dizziness can change direction, both within the attack and between the attacks. Um, whereas uh, peripheral vertigo tends to be consistent in the way you spin. You can spin around a vertical axis, or you can spin around a sagittal axis, or around a coronal axis that way. Now, vertical axis is the most common. When you lay down, it actually switches and it goes around a coronal axis. But when you're upright, vertical is normal. None of the other two are really very common. And unless you really know what you're doing with vertigo, I suggest you fire that back to the physician. The one you really don't want to mess around one, though, is the one that goes through a sagittal axis, so you feel like you're spinning backwards in particular. And that's usually caused by something really quite severe. Cerebellar pontine tumors, Arnold Chiari malformations, all the stuff you don't want in your clinic. So those should be going out. I would also suggest if there's some setting forward, some sort in forwards, um, you get that out as well. It's not as sinister as backwards, but just get them out, okay? Um, nystagmus, again, could be neurophysiological or neurological. It's often the result of vertigo. Okay, so if you're spinning this way, for example, I'm spinning, what would it be, uh, <laughs> anti-clockwise, then your nystagmus is probably going to go clockwise to the right. And it tends to be lateral. Um, If there is no vertigo present, if they've got type 2 non-vertigo dizziness and they've got type 2 dizziness and they're getting nystagmus, that isn't a vestibular ocular reflex screw up. That is neurological. Okay, so that one definitely has to go out. Um, and the nystagmus follows the same rules as a vertigo, basically. If this is neurological, it will last as long as a vertigo does. Um, Neurological nystagmus can also be linear, purely linear, just go straight out this way. Whereas peripheral uh, nystagmus has a curve to it, it's curvilinear. So it'll go usually downwards and out, downwards and out, downwards and out. But if it's going straight down, that's, that's true downbeat nystagmus. I know the vestibular therapists often call this 
downbeat where it goes down and out, but it really isn't. Um, straight down is the equivalent of vertigo going backwards. So that's a sign you definitely don't want to see. Okay. Um, these ones in bold are all neurological symptoms. Dysphonia is, uh, you sound like you've got laryngitis, but without the pain, basically. And it's paresis or paralysis of the vocal cord muscles. Dysarthria is um, inability to make, form the words properly. Dysphasia is an inability to make the words be contextual. So the words are formed perfectly well, they just shouldn't be there. And there's a bunch of different ones for this. Dysphagia is difficult in swallowing. Diplopia is true double vision. It's not just blurred vision, it's double vision. And you can easily test that against blurred vision because the patient will describe that as blurred. And if you want to get an idea of what it's like, if you just push on your eyeball through your eyelid and push it over a bit, you'll get two images. Yeah. Now, if you do it again, push it over, then cover up the good eye and you get back to one image. So this is a lack of coordination between the two eyeballs. So you've got one focusing on the on the what you want to look at and the other one not. So you form two separate Im um, images. So one way to check this, if they've got blurred vision, cover up one eye. If it becomes single, then cover up the, the other eye. And if that's single as well, this is what they're dealing with, is diplopia. Okay. Um, if it's blurred, then it's probably in the eye itself. So it's ophthalmic rather than neurological. Um, Strabismus is a wonky eye. So this thing is not centered properly and it just goes off and up. And that can cause diplopia. Now, if you get that in childhood, by the time you're about six or seven, I believe it is, maybe it's a bit older than that, um, then you go blind in the area. So you, your body actually shuts down one of the conflicting areas so you don't get diplopia. Um, but um, this is congenital, can be congenital, but otherwise it's considered as neurological. Hyperacusis, um, painful, um, it's painful input of sound, well not input, but it's painful perception of sound. So um, the sound is heard as too high or the frequency is too high, but it's painful when it comes in. And this is often caused by a paralysis of the stapedius muscle. And it's called, um, the, attenu the attenuation reflex, auditory reflex, the stupidus pulls the um, stirrup away from the um, window and jams it up against the other ossicles. So they can't oscillate very well and it keeps it, stops the window from oscillating as well, neither. So it reduces the amount of sound going into the inner ear. When the stupidus is paralyzed, that can't happen. So you get free sound going in there. So what is, was, was normal sound now becomes. Um, painful. And you can test this with a tuning fork, high frequency tuning fork. And it's not very nice anyway. If you get one high enough and you hold it to the ear, it's not very nice. But if you do it to a painful ear, they'll pull away from it compared to the other side. The problem you've got is you're going to be doing this to neck patients. And if there's an acute problem, you can bugger up the neck as well. So um, you see this with Bell's palsy also. Maybe an opiate, a codronopia is visual loss. And if it's neurological, it would be in both eyes, um, past the chiasm. If it's on one side, then this now becomes a peripheral neuropathy, really. It's not phthalmic neuropathy. But on both sides, after the chiasm, um, you'll get this. And it's usually um, homonymous. Okay? So it's both on the same side, both on the left side of the vision field. And heteronymous is on one side and then the other side. Um, now, most, nearly all of this stuff we're going to be interested in is with the vertebral artery. It may be that what you're seeing doesn't have anything to do with the vertebral artery, but you don't care. All right. It doesn't matter to you whether it does or not. You're picking up hard neurological signs. Most of this is going to be central. And if it's not, that doesn't matter neither. This, all of those definitely go back. If it's not been previously diagnosed, migraine as we've talked about, um, and we'll talk about it more when we when we get into this a bit more on the course. I don't have to worry too much about it now. Are there any others you want to discuss? Anything I've left out?
No, you're good. Okey doke. So, all right, so this is just looking at um, the causes of things and the source of them and signs and symptoms. So peripheral neuropathy uh, can be mechanical, direct compression of it, tearing of it, cutting of it, um, or it can be a disease process. Uh, diabetes and vitamin B12, I think it is, deficiency are the common ones. Um, but of course there are other ones, motor neuron disease and so on. But the ones we're gonna see mostly are peripheral neuropathies. The distribution of this, don't get this confused with um, a, um, a radiculopathy, all right? That's the first thing you're gonna think of. And it's reasonable that it should be, um, but get more detail on the distribution. Generally speaking, the distribution is different. And we're not just talking about distribution of the sensory loss, we're talking about the muscles involved as well. So this pain, if it's painful, if you get a neuropathic pain with this, it tends to be corsalgic pain hot burning pain, uh, whereas a radiculopathy will give you that lancinating pain. And the corsalgia tends to be ongoing, it doesn't flash on and off, it tends to be ongoing. Depending on how severe the neuropathy is, you can have really severe wasting of the muscle, um, severe weakness to the point of anesthesia, of, of uh, paresis, paralysis rather, and severe sensory loss to the point of anesthesia if the damage is strong enough. Now, you'll never ever see that with a radiculopathy because the tissues you're testing are innervated by two or three segments. So you never lose complete supply. These things are, are terminal though, and you, you can see this if it's bad enough. Um, I don't know if you can say that radiculopathy will give you fatigable weakness and peripheral neuropathies will also or won't also, I don't know. I don't see enough peripheral neuropathies. The medical literature doesn't seem to be that interested in the type of weakness again. I just don't know. Um, so you're stuck with it. I have no idea if that's going to help you. Radiculopathies, spinal nerve and nerve root. Um, compression again, obviously, that's one we're going to see all the time. But certain diseases, um, shingles is probably the most common one. Um, but tumours and that sort of thing may do this as well. Um, polio was obviously a, a big one here at one point. Um, so the distribution there is going to be se segmental or rather quasi-segmental. The autonomous area, though, the exclusive area of that, that nerve root um, should almost be anaesthetic on testing and it will stand out and it will be within what you consider the dermatome. Uh, you'll get lancinating pain with this if you get a neuropathic pain with it at all. Um, hypoacesia and paresis rather than anesthesia and paralysis um, and hyporeflexia, whereas you may get areflexia with a peripheral neuropathy. You may also get areflexia with a, a radiculopathy simply because some people's reflexes are so depressed anyway, they've lost it. Um, and you may have to go through all of those contortions with sensitization, put in your arms, all that stuff, trying to see if you can get any sort of reflex out of it at all. It honestly doesn't matter. Spinal cord myelopathies, uh, mechanical and diseases. You should not see this very often at all. Um, so you have to worry about tumors here. In the neck, a disc herniation from trauma often goes straight back, motor vehicle accidents are case in point, it often goes straight back and it may well indent the cord. Um, but you've got fat pads all around the spinal cord and the neck, and you may not see any um, spinal cord signs or get any symptoms from it. If you've got a congenitally small canal though, these things can be nasty, they just go straight back, hit the cord, and all of a sudden you've got a quadriplegia on hands. The thoracic disc is rare, at the best of times. And I think the incidence of a thoracic disc herniation causing neurological problems is a, as an incidence of about one in one million. And that's not to say it can't walk into your clinic, um, but you're gonna see all the effects of a disc herniation. You're probably gonna see parallel, um, um, 
if it's not, this is obviously not a quad require a, a quadriplegia or a para paraplegia. Otherwise, I'd be in a wheelchair and not in your clinic. But these more minor compressions may give you um, bilateral paresthesias, but you're unlikely to see a lot of pain going down the legs. All right, it's probably going to be paresthesia more than anything else. And then when you look at the legs, you, if you see any muscular involvement at all, you're likely to see it being spastic and um, hypotonic rather than um, hypotonic and weak. Um, so you're going to see a non segmental distribution. You may get coarse algae with this. Um, there may be, well be weakness. Um, what have I got on there? Am I reading the right one? No, sorry, I'm reading the wrong one here. Segmental distribution may or may not be lancinate pain, may or may not be cause algae, it's a bit strange. Uh, hyperesthesia, hyperreflexia, um, and uh, Babinski responses, possibly. Okay. Um, I missed that plexus and cord require, sorry. Um, so these are basically, again, spinal nerves. They're, they're lower motor neurons, so you should not be seeing upper motor neuron sides with one exception. So that this is often a disease form. Now, if this is a disease rather than a disc herniation, um, a neurological disease such as a tumor, then the somatic pain element of this will be much less than the neurological signs. So the signs will outweigh the symptoms considerably. If it's a disc herniation causing it, you're gonna see the pains going down the legs or through the arm and everything else. Um, and that's going to be the overriding complaint from the patient, not the neurological signs. Which is why we don't see many of these. Well, they're rare anyway, but we don't see them because um, they're just picked up differently. They don't come in because they're not getting pain. They're more likely to go see their doctor. So again, it's a non-segmental distribution. Um, Corsalgia is possible. Um, Weakness, atrophy, and sensory loss. And all of this may be a lot worse with a plexus than it is with the spinal nerve root because you're moving towards a termination of the neurological tissue. Brainstem, the big one for us is VBI. Um, but again, you can get tumors up there. You can get a brainstem concussion. Uh, with VBI, lateral medullary syndrome, which is, or Wallenberg syndrome. So all of these are a mix of long track and cranial nerve signs and symptoms, with the cranial nerve signs and symptoms being on one side and the long track stuff being on the other side. And with VBI, there may well be Horner syndrome. Um, so Wallenberg's is fairly specific to the lateral medullary syndrome, and it's you really don't care. If you're picking up brainstem signs, then you really don't care what's causing it. Um, stick them in a collar and get them in the emergency room. But you're going to see things, the symptoms are going to be dizziness. Um, you're going to get pins and needles hemilaterally down one side. You, you may see pins and needles on one side of the face. That may, both of them are going to be an overlying um, sensory loss as well. Horners, uh, we'll talk about more. If you don't know what it is, ask me now. Um, and I'll just give it to you quickly, but you get this split between long track and short track signs and symptoms. And then uh, cerebrum, concussion sucks. I hate concussion with a passion. Um, it used to be really quite simple. You had a head injury, not necessarily direct, but you had a head injury. Um, you lost consciousness, even if you couldn't remember it, there was probably, there was consciousness loss. And what you did have was memory loss. And those things actually came up to concussion. Um, and then this, the symptoms of this were variable the way they are now. But what you've got now is that's been taken out and now you've got all of the symptoms that you can possibly imagine um, going on and all of those attributed to concussion. There is almost no, I can't think of a single good operational definition of um, on, like rapid onset concussion. Can anybody think of a good operational definition of this? I'd appreciate it if you can. Anybody got one? No, no. So I think probably the best thing to look, be looking at for concussion is evidence of a head injury, direct or indirect. Um, 
no loss of consciousness later on after the injury. If you're getting that, then they've got a traumatic brain injury and possibly a bleed. Um, memory deficiencies, headache, uh, which can be variable. Um, and that's probably it. And everything else fits in. Then you've got mood changes and all the rest of this stuff. And most of, a lot of that stuff can actually be from the neck, including the memory deficit. Um, but it all could be from the neck. And I think there was a case on there, a hockey player, what's his name? Cosby, wasn't it? Who went through all this stuff, got manipulated by a chiropractor, and most of it cleared up. Um, the real problem you've got with this is the possibility of slow bleeds. Uh, and this tends to occur in older patients. So again, um, we'll get into that a bit more as we go. Um, the rapid bleeds, and younger people, and you'll never see them because they occur very quickly. Um, but all the, the thing with bleeds is they tend to have progressive headaches. Um, so the thing gets worse and worse and worse over a period of days. With a slow bleed, they can go three or four weeks before they collapse. So my suggestion is if you see this headache getting worse and worse and worse after the second day, get it out. Okay, they also tend to be gravity dependent. So if I've got a bleed occurring in the front here, for example, it will be when I bend forwards um, and the weight of the brain pushes on the hematoma and it's painful. Um, if it's on the side, it's when I lay on that side and so on. But they tend to be gravity dependent. After that, you get drowsiness um, coming on and then progressive cognitive loss. And then when motor dysfunctions occur, that patient is likely to collapse in your clinic. So get them out really early. Okay, so these are the conditions that we really worry about. Intracranial slow bleeds. Um, they tend to be in older patients, 60 plus. The injury actually also tends to be fairly energetic. I think most of these occur above impact speeds of 60 kilometers an hour, which is what, 100, 60 miles an hour, which I think is, what is that, 100? 90, isn't it, I think? Somewhere in there, 100. Um, so a rear end collision when somebody moves, you're static and you're being hit by 100 kilometers an hour, or two cars come together at 50 kilometers an hour. It's the velocity change, the deceleration that does this. And the reason it is in older people is because the brain shrinks as you get older and it pulls away from the dura. The dura is solidly attached to the skull and it pulls away. Now there's bridging veins between the brain and the dura or at least between the meninges, so that they get stretched. So any shear or torque forces can tear them. And because they're veins, they tend to bleed slowly. Um, so as I say, it can last some time. Concussions, there you go. Um, I really hate talking about concussions. Um, uh, but if anybody really wants to talk about it, we will do. Um, and there's no reason why you can't manipulate a concussed patient. All right, none at all as long as you're quite happy that there isn't anything neurological concerned. So I would say that last three words on the concussion line is important. There are no neurological signs and no ongoing loss of consciousness after the trauma. Um, VBI, uh, dizziness and headache. Now, neurological symptoms with VBI are rare. Um, even with a full hindbrain stroke, um, these tend to come on a week or so after the strokes happened. So what we're looking at is transient stuff. Um, so they are rare at the best of times. And with our patients, they're even rarer. So the five Ds that you learned are not going to be a major issue. They're not going to be there. Dizziness, headache, and neck pain. Now, the neck pain can be coming from the neck structures themselves, such as the, the joints and bones and everything else, the muscles. But it can also be coming from the torn artery. The headache and the dizziness are, are part, or can be both actually, it can be coming from the neck joint, so it's neurophysiological, but it can also be coming from the artery problem. Um, both of the, that's a case in both of those. So um, you've got to end up doing associating and dissociating coupling and decoupling these symptoms. Um, and I believe we talked about these, uh, or may have done it on a webinar somewhere. It's certainly in a webinar. If you go to um, the Nasty Triad 
one of the webinars I did, you'll find it there. Um, by the way, I just realized, I just found out something. I've been using YouTube for God knows how long, and I didn't know this has happened. I've moved all of the webinars into the public domain. So if you um, subscribe to one of the webinars, you can get them all, okay? Um, if you want to. But the one on the Nazi tribe talks about this in depth, actually. So um, don't go looking for neurological symptoms. You will find neurological signs when they are symptomatic, um, but not symptoms. They're very, very rare. Core compressions. Um, again, this is going to be mostly in the neck. You can actually get this in the cord equina, though. So in the cord equina, you can actually get a mix of upper and motor, lower, upper and lower motor neuron um, sites, long track sites, because if the, uh, the phylum terminale is well developed and extended, you can actually hit that and then start getting your um, upper motor neuron stuff. Um, but with core compression, that's what you're going to be seeing. This is almost always going to be from the neck. And the most common cause of this, I think you're going to come across, is stenosis. So this is going to be an older patient. Now, the Distribution can be bilateral, trilateral, or quadrilateral. If it's in the neck, it's going to be bilateral, certainly. It may be trilateral, which is on its way to becoming quadrilateral, um, or it may be quadrilateral. They may get no symptoms at all, no neurological symptoms at all of this. And the first one, the first symptom they get is a complaint of tripping. So they'll tell you they're tripping over stuff that's not there. Now that can be a balance problem or it can be a muscular problem. Check their balance. If their balance is okay on both legs, if it's okay, then it isn't a balance problem. Um, and then what you do is you test dorsiflexion and you repeat test it and repeat test it and repeat test it and seeing if it fatigues rapidly. They've got no endurance uh, because this is what it tends to be. The muscles okay when they start off often, but it gets weaker and weaker and they start tripping on it. But that may be the only symptom they'll give you. Obviously, they've got neck pain and arm pain from the stenosis, the somatic pain, but no neurological symptoms. So you want to ask them about that, all right? Dropping things, um, anything, a neurological sign in the form of a symptom, basically. And it's going to be muscular. Um, Cord requiner is going to be a bilateral segment of distribution, pain paresthesia. Now, it's going to include saddle paresthesia, but every time I teach this, what they do is they say they get saddle paresthesia and they run around along their crotch. It's true, but they won't tell you that. The saddle paresthesia is part of the leg paresthesia, and they tell you they've got leg paresthesia in the leg. You almost entirely always have to ask them if their crotch is tingly as well. You might want to say a little different to that, but you're probably going to have to say that anyway, okay? Horner syndrome, um, it's not a symptom, um, but it's, we need it anyway. So, um, an ophthalmus, the eyeball looks retracted, looks further into the head than the other one. And it's believed that this is actually a um, optical illusion uh, because of the smaller pupil and the minor ptosis it makes the eye look further away, but they don't think it is. In dogs, actually, you get a thing called retracting nystagmus, where the eye is actually pulled back into the head. So it actually is an ophthalmus, comes out and goes in again. Um, meiosis, very small. The meiosis from this isn't uh, cranial nerve three. This is the um, Muller's muscle weakness. It, they're called um, tarsal um, plates in the eyes. So these are superior and inferior tarsal muscles, so they open the eye up. So what you see is the upper eyelid droops a bit, um, but it's minor because the levator palpebra is still good. It's minor, and it may actually not even be there unless they get tired. So this may end up being a symptom that you can't see. If you look at their eye, you may also notice that the other lid has actually gone up a bit um, because what it does is it, pull it pulls it down. So it may actually go up. So you see this, the whole palpable fissure is a little bit narrower than the other side. It's not just that, but it can be difficult to see. Um, ptosis, sorry, that was ptosis I was talking about. 
Meiosis is a pupil and that can be difficult to see as well. So um, what they'll often do is when they're looking at this, they do it in a somewhat darkened room. So the other pupil opens up and gives you a better contrast to the other one, which doesn't open up. Um, but that can be difficult to see. And the facial reddening can also be difficult to see. I've got a picture somewhere of a woman that's called um, Harlequin syndrome, which is, you can actually see the line of the red going right the line down the middle of the face. Now this isn't Horner's. Um, it's got a different condition, uh, but it shows it perfectly. It's not always that easy. Anhydrosis is lack of sweating, and you may have to run your fingers down their face to see feel one slide slide up, slide on the dry side easier than it slides on the damp side, especially if you're in a dry area. Um, Edmonton's a perfect case in point where the stuff just evaporates off quickly. So it's not, the Horner's syndrome is not necessarily easy to see. If you go online and cook it in and look at the images, you'll see that it takes a little bit of seeing. Um, Pancos tumor is going to cause a brachioplexopathy and it's also going to cause Horner's syndrome as the tumor comes up, hits the lower brachial plexus and the um, inferior cervical ganglion now give you Horner's. Okay, now, have you got any questions on that or any other symptoms that you can think of? No, you good? This is gonna be an ongoing issue. Um, we're gonna overemphasize VBI in this course, very much so. It will be an overemphasis, it's disproportionate to the frequency you're gonna see it. The thing is, though, of all the things you can do wrong, it's cause a VB stroke. All right. Um, and there's no doubt about it, cervical manipulation does it. The frequency there is called the study, um, and it probably is quite rare. And it's going to get rarer if you can recognize a patient with it or one that you've caused so you don't manipulate it again, because the first manipulation generally doesn't cause the problem. It's the second one that releases the embolus that your first manipulation caused, the way you get the real problems. It's a fairly robust system, this. Um, so you don't want to manipulate it after you've caused neurological signs or symptoms. Um, so the first question I ask when I've manipulated somebody's neck is, how are you feeling? It's, have you had any of the following symptoms? Has the headache got worse? Has the neck pain got worse? Have you had dizziness? And then you can go on to the rest of it, okay? And I'm going to suggest you do a cranial nerve exam prior to every cervical manipulation you do. Each session. You don't have to do it for everyone. You can do it in that session. But for each session, you do a cranial nerve exam before the manipulation. Okay? Now, it's 11.50. Not sure. Well, let's get started. If you've got nothing else to ask me, let's get started on this. Pain behavior. You can't see that, can you? Um, sorry. I did that to you last week, didn't I? You're sitting there looking at a blank screen. Okay, so um, we talked about intensity. Now let's look at the way it behaves. You can have constant, continuous, or intermittent pain. Constant pain is pain that is always there. It doesn't change, all right? Um, now, I know that's usually given as pain that's always there, and that's the end of it. Um, but if you think about it, if you've got a intra-articular fracture of the knee, the knee's hot and swollen, and you're laying there and this thing is throbbing away and banging and banging and banging. That will often be considered as constant. Now, get your knee down on the floor and hop on that leg. What happens to that pain? It doesn't stay the same. It just gets wank, yeah? So it's not constant. And when we're saying constant, it's over a given period of time. That is, I cannot change it for better or for worse, it's constant. Now, as soon as you think of it in those terms, you know damn well this is not a locomotor system problem. 
with one exception, uh, but it really isn't a locomotor system problem. This is visceral, or it may be a primary cancer, where the, the tumor is so small that mechanical stresses don't bother it. Touching it does. Um, so I can change that way, but it's not the behavior of the pain, it's the palpation. Continuous pain is what's usually meant. So there's always some degree of pain there, but it goes up and down, depending on what you're doing. And in pain, there is no pain there normally until you do something to it. Now, in general, constant pain is severe pathology. Continuous pain probably has some degree of inflammation present, um, which is why it's an ongoing thing, but not necessarily. Intermittent pain, where there is nothing going on, is usually purely mechanical. All of that is dependent on the second one, which is irritability. And I'm going to define irritability as an exacerbation of pain after the stimulus of the pain continues. So you do something, you twist, you get a sudden sharp pain when you twist, and then that you get this ache pain afterwards and it lasts for a variable period of time. That is almost entirely going to be inflammation. Um, now, the, the, the more minor the stimulus and the longer the pain lasts, the more inflammation is present. The more intense the stimulus has to be and the shorter the duration, the less um, inflammation is present. So you can see we're continuous. Um, I can have a fairly high level of pain, which is subjective, um, but I need a massive stimulus and there is no um, ongoing pain, no consequences of that stimulus. There's no inflammation present or I can have a, um, a minor stimulus and a long period of pain, which suggests severe inflammation as well. So all of this is dependent. If I'm getting ongoing pain after the intermittent pain, after the stimulus for the intermittent pain, that's also inflammatory, or you consider it that way. Does that make sense? Is the onset sudden or gradual? If the onset is sudden, it's related to trauma, you're looking, and it's severe and sudden, you're looking at healthy tissue disruption, ligament tears, muscle tears, bone fractures, uh, but something healthy is fractured. If this is related to, uh, if the severity of the pain that comes on with trauma is, um, is mild, then you may have a degenerate or a pathological fracture, but that's the worst pain they experience is a sudden onset with more minor trauma. Okay, so um, a sudden onset without trauma is unusual um, and it's more likely to be a gradual onset. And I, that is a bit baffling why they will get sudden severe pain and no trauma. Um, and again, that may be the trauma isn't high enough for it to be considered traumatic. And this again could be a pathological or a um, degenerate fracture that still has enough bone for it to be. Uh, a tear or a muscle tear doing the same thing. Um, the gradual onsets are much more common. Um, you get a, a, you may well get a sudden onset of pain, but the severe pain comes on the next day. That suggests inflammation as well. Um, so um, the relationship to trauma, the suddenness of the onset of the pain, the severity of the pain is all important. Um, is it related to movement or posture? <laughs> we usually get end up getting both of these things. Um, movement gives you the severe pain, posture gives you the more achy pain. Um, and that's typically the way it goes. If this is purely postural, you may actually be looking at one of, if it's in the back, for example, you may be looking at the McKenzie postural syndrome, which really nobody understands, um, but it's fairly benign and you can usually get rid of it reasonably quickly. But a lot of it is about changing ergonomics, of course. Um, but we're more usually used to, um, as movement. Movement, provided it's not inflamed, will tend to help musculoskeletal pain. Postures tends to make it worse. Um, providing the movement is sensible and it's not an aggravating thing. So rest for me is not the removal of all stress. It's the removal of specific stresses that aggravate the condition. And movement can be considered a form of rest because it actually eases the pain. Um, aggravating and or relieving factors, they're usually opposite. Whatever makes it worse, not doing it makes it feel better. 
Um, but sometimes relieving factors are there. Um, I'm not sure how much the information you get from the relieving factors, except as a treatment form. I feel much better if I'm laying down. Okay, fine, that's, that's your posture. I feel better if I'm sitting or walking. There's your exercise. Um, the aggravating factors will give you an idea of the pathology sometimes. So a disc herniation, for example, is going to give you um, pain on flexion and extension activities and postures, whereas a mechanical dysfunction is going to be dominated by one movement or another, one direction of activity over the other. Flexion activities aggravate it, extension activities don't or may even relieve it. Um, but a lot of that is about the severity of the pain. So if I've got a, a very atypical mechanical dysfunction that is severely painful, um, then the same things that you get with a disc herniation, all movements being painful, is going to be similar to the um, biomechanical dysfunction. And this is probably a form of allodynia. Such severe pain, everything hurts. Um, but looking at the typical um, versus the atypical condition of all what, state of what we're looking at here, it generally does help you um, divide this up. Flexion, not extension, flexion and extension. Um, so on. Coupled and decoupled from each other. Um, so let's say we've got a patient with neck pain, pain down the deltoid. Are these the same coming from the same source? That is, are they coming from the neck? Because the shoulder rarely refers, approximately nothing really refers, approximately very often. So is this all coming from the neck? Does moving your shoulder hurt you? No. Okay, well, it's probably not the shoulder. Um, what about postures? Yeah, they hurt. Well, what doing what exactly? Well, it's when I'm sitting typing. That don't help you because your neck's in a posture, your arms are in a posture, and you can't tell what it is. So you need that. Uh, are they always there together? Is it when one gets worse, the neck gets worse, that the shoulder pain comes on? If the neck improves, does the shoulder pain improve? Um, and so on. So this coupling and decoupling is usually fairly simple, um, and you should undertake it rather than assume everything is coming from the neck even if they're connected, um, because that connection there is the shoulder pain's doing that, the neck's coming to there and they appear connected. You can also ask the patient, because they usually got a fairly good idea, but don't take their word as gospel. Where's the shoulder pain coming from? Where's the neck pain coming from? And they say, well, I think it's two different areas, but don't take it as gospel, because sometimes they can be as stupid as we are. Does it cause obligate or non-obligate functional loss? Um, and this is about the severity of the pain as much as anything else. So again, we see this division between using the illness scripts, which are a typical manifestation of the condition we're interested in, versus an atypical one. So I, again, I can have a mechanical dysfunction that is severely painful, and that severe pain is likely to give me obligate functional loss. So this can be useful, and it is useful when you have a typical presentation of these conditions, but it isn't necessarily when you've got atypical. So it's easy enough, and it's probably the right thing to do anyway. If I've got an atypical presentation of a biomechanical dysfunction, in that it's got severe pain, which is likely to give it obligate loss, which is also likely to give me more extensive preferred pain than I would normally have with a mechanical dysfunction, I'm thinking that is a mechanical dysfunction. What does it most look like? A disc herniation, and that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. You now do, um, your hypothesis becomes the disc herniation, and hopefully you disprove it. Okay. So, pain behavior in a nutshell. Do you have any questions? Anybody? No? God, I'm good at this, am I? All right. Um, okay. I've got some more videos I'm doing, so I'll send them out to you. Uh, also, if you subscribe to on YouTube to my channel, you'll also see these videos up there. Should be anyway. Um, so you can get onto all of those as well. All right. So I was saying to um, Harsh before Ed, I'm going to send you the, I've got, I've confirmed the place for the Calvary course. So I'll send you that address along with the Zoom recording. Um, it's in the north, 
east of Calgary, just off of Deerfoot on Country Hills Boulevard. Um, so I'll send you that. He's asked me about future courses. Right at the moment, I'm using Constant Contact. Um, so if you're subscribed to the newsletter on my website, you're also subscribed to Constant Contact. So if you'll get notifications of those. Then the next thing I do is put it onto the um, website, onto sorry, the division's website, and it gets advertised on there. So anybody on the um, subscribe to the newsletter gets first notification of the courses. Okay. Um, you also get notification of the webinars as well on that site, which I don't notify anywhere else. All right. You good? Okay, you might want to give some thought about it. It's a fair amount of information in a reasonably short space of time. All right, you look a bit stunned there, Michelle. You all right? Yeah, I'm all good. Okay. All right, so I'll see you all next Sunday, or I'll see some of you next Sunday. Thank you, Jim. Right. Thank Take you. care, everybody. Thank you, Jim. Bye. Thank you so much.